Welcome to the bonus episode of the Process Automation Podcast from AVB with me, Fran Scott. And yes, you did hear that right. We are starting with the bonus episode. And that's because today we are diving into the history of automation. And that will provide the perfect foundation for our next episode, where we'll explore future autonomous operating systems and their potential impact on industry. So to start, let me set the scene. Picture an industrial plant, maybe a power station, a water processing facility, or a metals processing plant. Now, it will be filled with, of course, specialized machinery and equipment tailored to the specific processes involved. And plants, of course, they look very different depending on their purpose, but they do share the need to monitor, optimize, and control how all of this infrastructure is operating. That's where automation and industrial control systems come in. Now we're returning to this topic, having previously covered it back in season one, where we discussed the role of automation as the brains of industrial operations. And it's a great description. These systems, they capture information from a network of sensors and instruments. They process and analyze this data and operate switches, relays, actuators on valves to control the processes at work. And the goals of this automation technology, they include maximizing production throughput and efficiency, enhancing safety for workers and helping to control environmental factors like noise levels and emissions. Now, if you work in these industries, you might know all of this already, but your friends and family, they might not. So how does automation make a difference to everyone's everyday life. Well, I am thrilled that we are joined again by Stefan Bakanak, the Senior Vice President of Process Automation Technology at AVB, to talk to us about the history of automation, this critical and often unknown part of our everyday world. So Stefan, we are going to begin back in the 19th century, so the 1800s, in the middle of the Industrial Revolution. What does the day-to-day -day work of an industrial operator look like at this time? Yeah, that was the time of the steam engine, uh, where muscle power was replaced by the power of a machine. And the steam engine is the first bigger device where a control mechanism, a control application was used to make the machine working. So you would you could say that's the first industrial automation application we have seen in the world. And in terms of what would uh, a general job look like at that time? Yeah, if, if you want to work with the machine, you, you had to go there. So it was hot, it was smelly, noisy, dusty, Maybe you, you have been uh, stubborn over other people, feeding the machine with coal. So it was a pretty dangerous area where the people had to live in uh, when they worked with the steam engine. And very physical. Absolutely. Yeah. So it was not a full replacement of the muscle power. Although the, the machine has much more power than the muscle before when, when you use the shower. Yeah, so the, the machines gave some mechanical advantage, but you still need to be physically strong to then help them the rest of the way. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so let's fast forward to the early 20th century, so the early 1900s. What has changed within that period? Yeah, when the industrial plants grew and you had several, maybe 20, 30, 15 steam engines at the same time, people started to realize it doesn't make sense to walk to every machine itself. So they started to bring up instruments on the machine and linked the instruments to a central room. So somebody could sit in a central room, in a housing, not uh, exposed to rain or something like that, to dust, and check if the machine is running in good state or does it have a failure. And only when there was a failure, the people had to go to the machine and fix the problem. So this was already a huge improvement compared to standing in front of the machine itself. So in essence, it's the birth of the control room. Absolutely. That, that when people understood they can remotely work with uh, things. Uh, and, and this really was a, a game changer for this time. 
And I suppose all these controls would still be mechanical, even if they are electrically mechanical, wouldn't they? This was before the uh, invention of uh, a phone or telecommunication. So we used mechanics, we used pragmatics, so more mechanical things to transfer data to a central room. Got, yeah. So pneumatics, the, you know, the changing pressure of water or oil or something to make something move from a distance makes makes total sense. So let's move on a bit now to the 1950s and 60s. How does the operator's work change throughout this period? So we still had the decentralized machine and the central control room. What was introduced at that time was the digital logic-based automation. So what is this? You, you all know the first television or the radio. It's the same technology. So digital logic-based hardwired control, as we call it, still without the computer, was helping to do simple control al algorithms or startup procedures automatically instead of doing it manually. And, and this was another leap step for automation because the first things which only have been done by the brain of the operators now moved into the machine. Before it was still only in the head of the operators and now it's done by, you could even call it a robot in today's terms. So I suppose it was the, would you say that's the introduction of automation? No, our definition of automation is, is a bit broader. So automation is even the mechanical device on a steam engine. But it's the extension, the innovation of automation. That's the way I would put it. Understood, understood. So things don't actually have to be uh, electronically controlled for them to be automated. That makes sense. Thank you for clarifying that. I just want to pick up on that logic control. So in terms of it would basically be like, if this, then do that. If this, then do this other thing. And that's what you mean by the logic control system. Yeah, yeah. There was a, there was a copper cable going to this logic controller. And it entered to an end gate, how we call it. So if two positive signals are on the end gate, then there was a positive signal at the out go. But it, that was all electronic. There was no computer, nothing involved. It, it was physics like in a radio or a television device. Understood. So I call that physical electrical controller. So like all of these relays and everything, they're very physical rather than being computer based, but it's still control. And it's, it's amazing if you go to even today, industrial plants are using that technology. And if you go in those cabinet rooms, you see 50 cabinets and they're all interconnected with a thousand of copper cables, small thin cables. And this is the logic between those devices. And it's, it's really amazing because you can see the automation. It's visible. You can touch it. It's not inside a computer. It's, it's 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 really built tangible and what we do very often with young young engineers to bring them to those sites that they understand how automation evolved over the years absolutely because that's something that your your gen zers they will perhaps not understand that before computers there was this this physical uh these physical electronics absolutely yeah so Let's keep on going on our timeline. So reaching the 70s, 80s and 90s, what does the role of a plant operator look like now? That was the time when computers have been introduced. So you have been able to bring a lot of information on the screen. And uh, the operator could sit in front of a, of a screen and see the pressure, the temperature, how the plant is running, if there is any failure, that was the introduction of alarm lists. Before they had, they have huge tableaus and they had, uh, uh, lights which indicated with red, yellow or green how the plant is running. And now all those lights have been moved into a computer, which, which gave them a lot of flexibility how to operate the plant. And uh, all of us know the development of computers. So this itself was a, continuous innovation, continuous revolution, because with more CPU power, you could do more things. And every every 10 years, there was a kind of doubling or factor 10 times more power available. And that was really the big driver of innovation in the automation scene at that time. Absolutely. And I suppose then it kind of makes sense that the control rooms that I visit, which are 
of very big infrastructure providers have that 80s, 90s feel because that is when they were first introduced. The way those control rooms look didn't change a lot. But the, what's in the computers and what they can do with it changed a lot. You don't see that when you walk into a control room. Uh, it's, there still might be a very old chair where the people are sitting. But the computer normally is pretty new, pretty, pretty advanced. Yeah. Absolutely. And what's going on behind the scenes is advanced. Exactly. Yeah. So you don't, should not misjudge by the, by the way the rooms look what technology is used. I have seen pretty old control rooms with the highest advanced technology you can imagine. Absolutely. And so we are catching up with the present day slowly. So how has automation evolved over that last remaining 25 years? What have we seen change? A, a big step was when 2004, we introduced ATNX A, uh, which is extended automation. So there we introduced the concept of aspect objects. And today, with the naming we have today, you would say this was the beginning of Digital Twin, where we want to make a, a software mirror of the reality. An aspect object was the first thing going that direction where we made a motor, an object in our control system. And around this motor, you could open the documentation, you could open the alarm list. So that was a kind of how we changed the data structure of the DCS. So it was running before on a computer and afterwards, but we introduced the data handling as a new concept into the industry. And now we're taking the next step by connect the control system towards the cloud using AI, making data available, uh, make it happen that cloud-based applications can be used, the data out of that in the control system, so this open to the, to the outside world. This is the final step uh, we are introducing at the moment. And so in terms of that operator's job role, what would they be doing today? Today, the, the, the operator still has the task 24-7, 365 days a year to run the plant. So what we do with our control system, help him to do that in an efficient way, help them to do it in, in, in the best way to don't miss a failure, be fast when a plant fails to get it up running again. So the, the change in the, in the screens is not so big in the recent years, but the additional tools we give the people to be more efficient, to be more reliable, this is where the improvement is happening at the moment. So if you from outside walk into those rooms, they may no, not look very different the last 10, 15 years. But behind the scene, there's a lot happening, which helps the operators a lot. Understood. Gosh, so it's been, it's been quite a change, hasn't it? But at the same time, these are industries and infrastructures that can't really have downtime, right? True, and, and that's why the control room is the heart of the plant. So th those control rooms are occupied 24-7. Uh, meanwhile, when and that's another advantage regarding productivity, meanwhile, very often there's only one person sitting in the control room. If you go back 15 years, there maybe have been five, six or seven sitting in the same control room doing the same job. And, and that's what we mean with productivity. We don't take any shortcut on the, on the process plant output. We try to make it more productive by doing the same or even better with less people. Uh, and that's possible with the new technology and will we'll continue because we want to head towards autonomous operation of those plants. So our final target is at the end, be able to run the plants without direct interaction of the humans. And it's, I suppose it's kind of less people at the, let's call it the coal face, but there might be more people behind the scenes innovating. Yeah, we, it's not about reducing the jobs. It's, as with the steam engine, standing in front of the machine is worse than being in a central control room and all, only visit the, the, the steam engine if there's a failure. So you could say in even the old days, you have stolen the steam engine person the job. But that was not a kind of perspective. And that's the same today. It's, it's taking away the, the, the difficult jobs, the boring jobs, 
the, the jobs where you don't add a lot value by staring at the screen and only be available when there is a failure is making sure that the human being can concentrate on things where they add more value for the customer. And, and this is the identical perspective. Absolutely. And it does echo the sentiment back from the Industrial Revolution of where actually when it came to like the spinning Jenny, it was like, oh, actually, we like doing this. But actually, when it came into practice, people were like, oh, we see the advantage that this is giving us. And perhaps we shouldn't have been doing this as a human being in the first place. So, gosh, it's been it's been quite a change over those centuries and the last few decades. So where do you see it going next over the next 25 years, let's say? I think when you are in a situation, you, you always think things are going slow. But if you lack, look back 100 years, you see, OK, it's it's amazing the volume of change we did in that 100 years. My expectation, it will go even further. So there will be just the implementation of AI in our industry will keep us busy the next 10 to 15, 20 years. And I don't know what will come after we have autonomous operation of most of the plants. So that's a tough speculation. I have no idea. So let's implement those changes we have now towards autonomous operation and then future will show. But I'm sure it will never stop. And when do you see autonomous operation coming into practice? Is it already there? And when will it be everywhere? It's already there. So we have plants that run autonomous overnight, for example. Uh, my speculation, the most critical plants, maybe another 10, 15 years. But it's hard to guess until we see it there. And when it comes to what's next, that's anyone's guess. I quite like that. Let's let's tackle this bit first and then let's see what the next 50 years brings us. But um, it will bring change, no doubt. And this is what I tell especially young people, young engineers. If you want to have an interesting job with a lot of things happening, where innovation is just part of the game every day, I think this is the place to be. Process automation is a, is a bit hidden. But on the other side, it's very exciting and you really you really work on things that are important for the society. Absolutely. It may be hidden, but it affects us all. True. Brilliant. Stefan, thank you so much for talking to us today. Thank you. A huge thank you to our guest Stefan for setting us up so perfectly for our next episode where we will look at what's next for autonomous operating systems and how this could shape the future of production plants. If you want to get involved and join us as an expert, then follow the link to ABB's website in the episode description, where you can let us know your domain of expertise. I'm Fran Scott, and the Process Automation Podcast is a fresh air production for ABB. Follow now for free wherever you get your podcasts so you never miss an episode.